This is a good time to talk about uh, uh, my new book, Blasphemy and Apostasy in Islam, Debates in Shiite Jurisprudence, this book. Uh, it was published by Edinburgh University Press in association with uh, uh, Aachen University Institute for the Study of Muslim Civilizations. The book was translated by Dr. Hamid Mavani, and I wrote a uh, long introduction to it myself in English. I try to talk today about, in a few minutes, about uh, this book in three parts. Introduction, its introduction, uh, and the first part of it that is about uh, uh, blasphemy and uh, apostasy, and the third part is about uh, free speech and uh, hate speech and uh, free uh, expression in Islam, the right to freedom in, in this case in Islam. In the text, it has a story. In 2010, November 2010, uh, I read a very sad news. It was about assassination of Rafiq Taqi in Azerbaijan according to a fatwa uh, of a Muf Iranian mufti that passed away a few years before this assassination. Uh, it was, the mufti was uh, uh, Ayatollah uh, Muhammad Fadil Lankarani and uh, he issued this fatwa in 2006, and uh, in 2010, one of the followers of that Ayatollah so assassinate uh, this person as a journalist and writer in Azerbaijan, and he accused him to apostasy, irtidat, takfir. Why? Because he wrote an article on this issue. Uh, the son of this mufti was my classmate when uh, we were we studying Makasib in Qum Seminary. He expressed his joy, expressed his joy the, about the assassination of this person, and he wrote that he went directly to the hill, and uh, he said it's a correct action. Uh, he was murtad. He was apostate. When I read this, I uh, wrote a short paper, short response to my former classmate that this is wrong way and we should stop uh, such a things about uh, apostasy and blasphemy. He responded to me and another criticism without mentioning the name. Uh, three times longer than my uh, letter. It was open letter. And when I read his second, his uh, response, uh, I wrote a long treatise on exactly this issue that is the main body of this book, later become this book. Uh, it was something about that uh, examining the arguments of uh, blasphemy and apostasy in Islam. And he did not respond after that to this. I combined all of it together. It means uh, the background of the fatwa. After that, the response of uh, my first criticism, his response. After that, this is my treatise. And also some appendix that is uh, the articles that was the cause of this uh, assassination. All of them are uh, gathered in a book. This is the first, I think the main part of this book. And this is a debate. This is a real debate between a traditionalist jurist and a reformist jurist from Shiite sides. It's interesting that uh, about 
it's in 1950s, we have the same debate in Cairo between two different jurists, one traditionalist and one reformist on that time, exactly on the same subject. And in the introduction, I explained this story that uh, it, this is the parallel to what happened in Sunni Islam. Later, it happened in Shiite Islam about exactly the uh, right of freedom of speech on one hand and the punishment of uh, apostasy on the other hand. So in this uh, main part, I discussed all the details. It is good that you can see, you can read uh, the, the arguments of punishment, this punishment of apostate from a traditionalist jurist. And on the other hand, we can uh, listen to a reformist jurist how they deal with these uh, arguments. Their arguments is some verses of the Quran and uh, I explain in the last chapter of this part, uh, there is nothing in the Quran in support of uh, worldly punishment of the apostate and blasphemer. It means that everything that they uh, attributed to Quran is wrong. Uh, what we have in, is some, some hadith and consensus. I examined those hadith and mentioned uh, the chain of transmitters on one hand and their indications on the other hand. They uh, claim that they are mutawatir or most of them are sahih, it means they're authentic. I prove this is wrong. We do not have any mutawatir hadith in the case of uh, apostasy and also uh, blasphemy. And most of them are not authentic. Only seven of them, only seven in all of these issues, they are in traditional perspective, they could be authentic. And I mentioned and criticized them that they are, they have some problems. Also these authentic hadiths, they have some problems. They are khabar al akhbar al akhat It means singular hadiths. And singular hadith, this is something new in, the, in this book, that uh, validity of the, this type of hadith means akhbar al ahad are problematic in uh, important issues, essential issues. And this is the issue of life. As you know, we have three important issues. These are the case of, the case of caution. So we cannot say this is the position of Baraha or we can do anything that we want to do in, in this case. The most important case is the case of life of human being. So life of human being cannot be removed by some a few uh, singular hadiths. They are not hujja, they are not valid. We need a, a strong muhkamul uh, kitab. It means a clear indication by a verse of the Quran or by a hadith mutawatir. It means that also it should be nas, it should be completely clear. So we do not have such a verse in the Quran. We do not have such a hadith in also combinations of hadith, this compilation, compilation of hadith. So it's one point here. Another point that all of these hadiths are against the Quran. You know, the validity of the Quran, the validity of the hadith, they should not be in opposition to the Quran. If they are in opposite, it means they are not valid. So this is the second, uh, I think, argument against these hadiths, a few hadiths that they rely on it. And we have another issue that about consensus. And I examine the consensus, they rely on those hadiths. This is not something that we can al madraki. So also this is wrong. We cannot rely on it. The other issue, I mentioned that the subject of uh, apostasy and blasphemy was changed. On that time, apostasy was not only changing the religion simply. What was that? On that time, it was you after going out, changing your religion, it means you're joining to the infidels. Betrayal, 
It means you are against Islamic governance on that time. But today, changing the religion and converting to other traditions, it does not mean the same as it was before. So it's so important, this point is so important. It means the uh, subject of these two terms is, are not the same, they are different. Another way that I uh, ran in this uh, book is about Wahnul Islam. It means if you kill, assassinate, or murder a person in the name of Islam or because of converting, so this is weakening the Islam. It's not, it's, it's not a strength in the Islam. It's something that they say, okay, coming to this religion is free. But going out of this religion is forbidden. This is not freedom. This is against many verses of the Quran. La ikraha fiddin. What does it mean? We have about 100 verses against this understanding. More than this, this is the first major part of the book. And I criticize one by one all of the traditional argument in support of assassination or worthy punishment of the apostate. Not only uh, killing, assassination, everything. I said, we do not have any punishment for converting from Islam. If it's wrong, it's up to the God, to God in the hereafter, not anyone in this world. In the last part, the second part of the book, this is about hate speech. And my point here is about Sabbu Nabi, or we can say in the modern world, blasphemy. So do we have any punishment for this? In this case, not about irtidad apostasy, I say this is the case of hate speech. And the case of hate speech, in some countries, there is no word punishment for it. In some countries, a few countries, including European countries, they have a very mild punishment, not something like, uh, for example, uh, killing or uh, prison, uh, imprisonment or something like this. Uh, some financial punishment, nothing more. I mentioned that maybe we can start that if we accept this is hate speech, after that, if we do not have any punishment for hate speech, after that, we give room for fundamentalists to do what they have done. So the best thing is, I think, stopping it with going to the court and the judge decide about this issue. So this is something or only a suggestion and expressing and supporting the freedom of expression. This was the book that was written. I wrote it about 10 years ago and uh, translated, as I mentioned. And the third part of my uh, this talk, book talk, is about the introduction. The introduction, I wrote it about two years ago. And this is genealogy of uh, the, the, or the punishment of uh, apostasy and blasphemy in Islam since late 19th century, both in Sunni and Shiite. The introduction has three parts. I examine all the Sunni scholars that they have different understanding about apostasy since Muhammad Abdul among the Sunnis and later among the Shiites. And I divided Sunni scholars in three categories, traditionalists, neo-traditionalists, and reformers. And for each, for each of these categories, I gave some examples and some direct quotations and the turning points of what they wrote. I think the introduction is the book is more important than its text. In the Shiite parts, also literature review of Shiite jurisprudence and tafsir both about these two. It means punishment of the apostasy and blasphemy. 
also in three categories, traditionalists, neo-traditionalists, and reformists. I mean the difference between these three, traditionalists, their fiqh and usul, both methodology and uh, jurisprudence are traditional. Neo-traditionalists are in between. Their usul al fiqh or methodology is traditionalist in this case, but their fiqh is a little bit modern one. But the reformists in both fiqh and usul are they, they made something, some revision in the framework of Islam. So I introduced the most important, the most distinguished scholars for both Shiite and Sunnis. They have something new in the case of this issue. So from Tunisia, from Egypt, from Iran. So we have from all these countries, I found something new and they gather together. And in the third part of the introduction, I talked about my book and the history of uh, also my evolution in this point and comparison with all of those reformist scholar, Sunni and Shiite, what is the difference between this book, the product of this book, and the, the other Sunni and Shiite scholars in the case of apostasy. I think at the end, uh, we can say this, that uh, in which way we came by today. It means how we learn that apostasy and blasphemy should not have any punish, any worldly punishment, uh, and not neither uh, assassination or murdering, nor uh, any other worldly punishment like imprisonment or separation from the wife or uh, uh, for example, uh, removing all of your ownership to your, your property that we have in, uh, in the Faqih books about this. I think Islam was a religion of mercy and freedom from the beginning. This thing, this uh, punishment of apostasy is against that uh, point. My last point is this attribute attributed to Prophet Muhammad in this hadith, man baddala deenahu faqtuluh. This is the most important hadith that we have about uh, murdering of, punish, uh, of uh, apostate. And a person who converted, it means change his or her religion, he should be, he or she should be killed. So it includes also Islam. If someone also convert to Islam from Christianity, according to hadith, you should kill him. I proved in the book, this is a fake hadith. Never, ever Prophet said this. And this is so important because this is narrated in many uh, authentic Sunni books, Saha, Saha or Sitta, some of them narrated it. And I mentioned something and I narrated from the reformist Sunni scholars that reached the same point that this hadith is not acceptable. And all the other hadiths, we have this problem that uh, also in the book, I prove this point that we have no one in the time of Prophet Muhammad that was killed only solely because of apostasy. If there was some punishment, it was because of other crime that they, they made, not only for apostasy. So it means that practically we do not have anything for, uh, in Islam, in supporting this issue, theoretically, neither in the Quran, nor in really authentic hadith, that we can defend it, not only in traditional way. It does, I think it's a baseless understanding of Islam that we can kill or punish apostate or blasphemer in this world. I hope that you can read this book and enjoy it and let me know uh, your idea about this book. Thank you.